So the most complex machines ever. We have a tendency to believe that this is the status quo. Everything has always been like this. It seems to be a human nature thing that we've, we've all got our mobile phones and our iPads and, uh, and our smart TVs and our engine management systems and all of this kind of kit is all around us and there's a big assumption it's always been like that but of course it hasn't, it hasn't been like that and the machines that surround us today are truly the most complex machines ever that have been made by man and it's, uh, it's, a, it's a tremendous thing to think about because that means that the next generation of these things will also be the most complex machines that have ever been made by man. And as I shrug off my mortal coils, which no doubt under the normal sequence of things I will do before you do, then I'm going to be leaving you with this lot. You're the ones who are going to be designing the next generations and the generations afterwards of the most complex machines that have ever been created. And uh, there's no point in looking to me to tell you how to do it. You're going to have to find it out for yourselves, because that's what we've all had to do as we were going along. <coughs> well, hopefully, though, there is a little bit of um, uh, things that we can pass from the past into the future. And the only real way we can make any observations about that is to actually look at what's come from, out from, from my past to help me along the way. Now... <coughs> Just to give it a bit of scale, this is the entire circuit diagram of a telephone back in 1964 to 1984. There's no, not a single transistor in there. Um, <clears throat> these diodes are the closest thing you get to a transistor. They're actually metal um, oxide diodes and they're non-linear. And they use them for uh, helping with the AGC. And the other thing they use are these two positive temperature coefficient resistors. You can call them light bulbs. They were, they were small bulbs which were glowing red and they were the AGC control. But that is an entire telephone. You look at today's telephone. I can't even begin to draw the transistors on there because there are so many. I can only draw it as a block diagram. And the, the system components in it, you can well imagine for a function which is still not a million miles away from that, that this is actually a totally different vehicle. Now, we still consider ourselves designers but there weren't any IC designers involved in the design of that telephone. And there weren't any software designers in the design of early electronic systems. Software design and embedded software came in at a later phase. So we've seen an evolution of technology, not just in the outward appearance of a telephone, but in the, um, the underlying skills and technologies and methods which are embodied in it. Embodied in it. Interesting concept. So the products have changed hugely in my life, technology and methods and tools, yeah, you expect those, but also the business models and globalization. Um, the roots of uh, ARM as a technology is Acorn, the computer b uh, company, who made the computer which was known as the BBC computer in schools, for schools, and it was a program which, uh, which the government sponsored, which was called the BBC Computers for Schools program. And that company only made computers, a desktop computer, for the UK market. That was it. It didn't think of that, the whole world as being an opportunity. And principally, it was too difficult to sell a product which met the specifications required, safety specifications and regulations in different countries. It was too difficult to handle the contractual aspects of, uh, of taking money from another company in return for giving them something, a, a computer. All of those things have changed in the background as well. It was also very difficult to communicate with those, with those companies because not only didn't they speak English, but your phone couldn't phone them. You had to book a phone call even to America in the days when I first moved down into Plymouth. So that's within 40 years ago. Now this is a very much difference because of course there's a lot of things which have changed that environment but the changes in those environments have, have enabled this kind of product to become viable because it can be sold internationally because it can be made by a communal effort. So it was continuous, it was imperceptible and it's changed and it continues to change. But they were all research and developed so even this thing had a research and development activity. And look at the lifetime of this incidentally. This product didn't change for 20 years. This product changes about once a year. 
It's a hugely different environment that we're working in. <clears throat> so is anything old, including me, relevant to today's products? Let's hope so. I'm going to start really far back though, because really in, in illustrating just how um, this is the most complex systems and the most complex machines that have ever been produced, we've got to go right back to the beginning of man. So 35,000 years ago, that's us, we emerged as Cro-Magnon man from the primeval swamp. The thing that preceded us was Homo sapien, so-called wise, and he existed for 100,000 years. They didn't do much in technology. In fact, their mission primarily was just to survive, and it took them over 32,000 years to get to this, which is not bad, you know, it's a, it's a mud hut, and it's certainly better than sleeping on the streets. Oh, well, didn't have streets, of course. The philosophers, and again, we've heard these names, Pythagoras, Socrates, Plato, you know, they're, uh, they're names in our history there somewhere, but it's difficult to put them into context, but they were about between one and two and a half thousand years ago. Um, and really, these are the guys who'd, they got enough food and they got enough warmth, and they were starting to look around because they were a bit bored, and they started to bang things together and ask some questions about what the difference between water and, and solid things is and stuff like that. But they started this mission, if you like, to understand aspects of nature. Then the scientists, only around a thousand years ago, uh, De uh, Galileo, Descartes, um, Will uh, William Gilbert, of course, for electricity, who at least in, the, in our domain, they had, they had never been scientists who were interested in this before. So we've already moved from 35,000 years ago to 1,000 years ago. 34 of, those, 34 of those thousands of years, we were not doing anything in this area. But they now started on the exercise of manipulating nature. Okay, I've got a bucket of water. What happens when I mix it with something? Um, and what happens when, when you do things? But they still hadn't achieved the next great break, breakthrough, which was the engineers. Just 260 years ago, the Industrial Revolution, eight generations ago, that's all, was the real breakthrough of the exploitation of nature. So this is the, the opportunity here, we understand a little bit about the nature of materials, we start to look at the consequences of mixing them, and we start to look at the possibilities, hey, I could sell this to people, they might actually pay me for it. <coughs> well of course there was a slight problem there, is most people didn't actually have money. So they had turnips, and they had potatoes, and things of that nature, so uh, a lot of the early um, exploitation potential was limited because of the lack of availability of money uh, in, the, in the average person's hands. If you were a big landowner or something like that, then you had gold, but most people didn't have actual money at all. <coughs> but it is interesting to note that that is effectively year zero for, uh, for our science. Come on, machine. I'm struggling with a Mac. I moved over to a Mac, it's called Progress. But what we've seen here is it's an extracted program, an extended, extensive program, but it is research, development and produce. Extended. I mean, this is a, the first cycle of that program. <clears throat> and it's essentially our Big Bang. Only 250 years ago, there was a Big Bang that produced engineering and science. We didn't exist more than 250 years ago, except in specific small, small pots. But as an entity, it was the exploitation which suddenly raised the requirement for performance. We needed speed down this route. We also realized, gosh, if we manipulated things in a different way, we could produce something which is even more exciting, and we can sell that to even more people, and we can get rich. So anyway, we're going to go back to computing a little bit, because generally we also make big mistakes in the computing domain as well, and we make it because of misunderstandings. We, we're so used to using terms that we seldom understand what the terms mean. We just use them as shorthand. It helps with the communication because you're communicating with a whole bunch of other people who are just like you. So they understand what you mean when you use those terms because it gains context from that. But when we think about computing then, we tend to think of it like this. And yet, computing is not really like that. That's computing. Computing is just an implicit mathematical model. So that's a belief that mathematics has some value. Um, and it's a, 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 an ability to take an ab abstracted input phenomena 
process it and draw some conclusions from the outside. It's a model. So Wikipedia tells me that um, it doesn't necessarily have to apply to mathematical formula, it can apply to human thinking. And if you look at your smartphone, it's not actually, I say outwardly, it's not processing numbers, it's delivering some sort of functionality. It's used to animate analogies, and these are wonderful things because it's frequently, it always has to be fast enough to be useful, which means that time and, uh, and state are an important part of this as well. But if you are um, if you're controlling some sort of stabilization loop, then that gives you the idea of the time scale that's involved in it. It doesn't say anything about the implementation technologies, nor is uh, prescriptive about programmability. It's just processing, exercising a model. So if we go back and look at the first models then, uh, Antikythera, this is a wonderful machine, 100 BC. As far as everybody is concerned, this is the first machine, and it was used as a computing um, vehicle for planetary positions. Now if you think about this, this was made before there were tools, essentially. And although there was metal available, you know, there was the Iron Age and the Bronze Age which predated it, the material was essentially made by hand. So whoever put this thing together probably made the metal that it was made of. They had actually made the files to cut the teeth, and it was an achievement, believe me, way beyond what, what the a little piece of metalwork looks like. In fact, it took What's the time? I wrote it down here. 1,800 years for um, Graham to produce essentially the same machine. But because he had machine tools and he had proper sources of material, his machine looks much, much more sophisticated. Though, of course, not terribly sophisticated by today's standards. So it's, it's technologies, factory-made metals, machine-cut gears, wood, wood. And the product, yep, they used to make products which had wood in. I mean, now even tables don't have wood in, do they? Um, but George Graham was a clockmaker, so I guess at that stage there was also clocks. Now this is an interesting one too, Babbage's difference engine, because um, here was a machine, and it's, it's metal, precision gears, digital base, 10, and it was, um, it was conceived without recognition of the limit, limitations of the technology available at the day. So they actually made it in 2010. 2000, sorry. And it was a mechanism for com computing polynomials, but they hadn't been able to make it before then. So although he created this thing, although it would have worked, he couldn't actually produce it. The planimeter, that's a fascinating vehicle. Again, one of the things that comes as soon as you start to have the sort of me um, uh, machine, metal machining capabilities and quality of machines, you can actually start to produce a machine which calculates the area of an abstract um, surface. The, uh, the planimeter is still available today, a little bit more modern. And of course the same story with the computer. This is University of Manchester's baby, which is the generally recognised as the first st uh, stored program computer. Uh, again, computing mechanism doesn't have many gears and uh, shafts or big handles to turn, but nevertheless it's still just computing. It's using electronics, although most people would say, well valves, uh, are they really electronics? Well, they're associated with the flows of electrons, and it's digital based too, so it's got a lot of similarity to uh, modern computers. The, con the, 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 the conclusion I hope you would see in this is that the implementations running back in time have been limited by the technology which is available to the engineers. So it was engineers who were producing the solution the only thing they had available was the, the technologies which were, which were available to them. So they could have designed this using transistors, but the transistor wasn't available. And uh, uh, Amstler's planimeter, he could have digitized it rather than have to, to do this marvelous analog system, but he didn't because that technology wasn't available to him. So the technology available at any particular time limits what you can, what you can achieve. And the, complex, the story is a little bit more complex than that, and so I'm going to delve a little bit. Because compute, this is computing today. The vast majority of computers that are sold today are like this. They don't look like computers. 
they're not bought for being computers they're bought for being something else a book, a watch, a camera a printer, TV it's something else they just happen to have a computer inside them and indeed the level of computing inside these products it way exceeds what was, what was available uh, in um, operations like the university only a few years ago, probably 20 years ago <coughs> so they're purchased by consumers who have no feel no awareness for the technology which is in them they don't buy them because of the technology they buy them for their functionality now these are interesting class of products because these are non-vital but there are a whole class of other ones which are vital um, so you know uh, energy management transportation uh, vehicles health the financial uh, institutes you don't want any of these failing and yet the people who are buying these are still not buying them for the technology they're buying them for their functionality so we've been very successful in some ways that we've uh, we've hidden the complexities of technology away from our customers the penalty of that is our customers don't have to think about technology anymore and they don't think about what we do in it and our role and how it evolves or how how important it is or anything else like that because essentially it's just the product who has a functionality that's required <coughs> now to delve a little bit more uh, we're getting much closer to uh, to real time now 17 years I guess even most of you were alive when cameras looked like this um, this is a camera look at, looked at in an abstract way it's a mechanism for enhancing your memory that's the principal thing you might use it for and the technology back in 1998 was excellent lenses, fine mechanical mechanisms, electromechanical for the exposure, metal and some plastics, not a lot, uh, manual assembly, these are assembled by lots of ladies sitting in, in uh, large rooms, large clean rooms, and very, very careful stuff. And the photochemical memory, I like that, because it's, uh, it's not something that we normally associate with memory process, but we call it film for, uh, for uh, simplicity. Now, today's camera is still a Canon camera 2014 just 17 years later it's still a mechanism for enhancing human memory but the technologies that are incorporated in it are very different the uh, digital logic software um, no, it's not going to occur yet so I've got a flow in mind obviously look at this uh, excellent lenses are still there analog electronics that were never there before, sensors and transducers, precision me mechanisms, micro motors down and down it goes and the thing that really gets me at the bottom part of this is its robotic assembly because you can't assemble this camera by hand it's too precise, it's too re it, it requires dexterity which can't be achieved any, any other way the creation of this camera then has technology which is not embodied in the camera so you couldn't have the camera if you didn't have the, me the uh, manufacturing mechanism to support it so, that, so the encapsulated technology is more than just that that's inside the box <clears throat> now if all of these technologies are available to 21st century businesses today <clears throat> and we can say you know I could go out and I could buy a lens or I could go and talk to a company who makes lenses and I could get a lens if all of those technologies are available to 21st century businesses today and if that is an armed computer then the logical question is why or could arm make a camera to compete with Canon now of course it's a joke uh, you know arm is uh, an IP company and Canon is a, is a uh, photographic company with a lot of history but why couldn't we and the answer is of course that although the technologies are there we don't have the capabilities to use them so there is another limitation factor which comes in this and that's capabilities and capabilities are what the company has embedded in itself so we move on a little bit and I think that's the yeah so it's actually capabilities that limits limits a business's product possibilities the good news on that is it's an entry barrier too so the reason that ARM couldn't make a, a camera to compete with Canon 
is not only limited by the fact that we, couldn't, we don't have the capabilities that they have, but we, they're not, they're not going to tell us exactly how they go together either. So there's more to it even than simply the list. And that, that is the, uh, one of the main reasons about why they don't get huge amounts of competition. Making a camera is not that bad. Making a really good camera is difficult. So businesses need to know they can make products before they start. And again, this is a, it's one of those isn't that blindingly obvious uh, conclusions, but it's not. Businesses, like bumblebees, have a habit of just flying. Uh, they don't think about the aerodynamics of, of flight and whether their muscles are powerful enough for their body mass. They just fly. And businesses do the same. They've always done something. They always carry on doing it. Frequently they get into trouble when they, re when they don't realize that the thing that they're doing is going beyond their current capabilities and they haven't made any preparation for the capabilities that are missing out. So they help ma manage the risk when you, uh, when you know they're, when you know you need them and you can put them into place. Uh, and there's frequently no second chance in business these days. The global economy and the uh, globalization of business means you don't get a chance to get it wrong. You're out of business. Making a product is still work, even when you've got the capabilities, but it's based on, know, uh, on knowledge. It's based now on um, uh, quantified, understood technology. Technology in your company, when your company knows how to, how to uh, use it. Using unknowns just leads to protracted timescales, blown budgets, lost opportunities and panic. Um, you say this in a business context and everybody understands it very well. Panic is what happens most of the time. The usual reason is that one of these things has gone wrong. You don't have the capability that you thought you had. Now the capability is not just technology, the capability can be in business as well. You thought you had a market for this thing, you didn't. You, you, you thought you had a way to sell it, you haven't. Uh, you thought you have a way to make a contract with a company in Japan, you don't. You know, so capabilities are more than just technology. So businesses need an appropriate set of capabilities before they can commence a product development. Now, most businesses, despite what business schools will tell you, don't produce just one product. And they frequently produce lots of products which are quite different from one another. So Arm is a uh, company which is known for its, its CPUs. But actually, of course, we deliver software as part of that product. So the CPU is an, an important component. It's part of the ecosystem that we deliver, and I'm going to come back to ARM in a, in a few minutes. But it's not the only thing that we deliver, and we deliver lots of things. And each one of those things requires a different set of capabilities. Now, clearly, we need to have the appropriate set for each one of the products. And some products, which can be very, sim very similar sounding, can actually be very different in the capability sets they need. So the difference between our largest CPU and our smallest CPU, one which is aimed at um, really being used on any process at all and the other one which is, being fo which is focused on high performance, becomes a major issue in terms of the capabilities that you need. So they're, they're not the same. Some of them could be subsets. So it's worth looking at some of these definitions. I'm not going to go through these blow by blow, but they're wordy slides and, and they will be available to you so you can look at them yourself. But it's fair to say that products contain capabilities, capabilities contain technology, and science uh, and technology contains science. But it's not a one-to-one -one relationship. So science does not become technology, technology does not become capability, and capability does not become product. It's a simplification that people are all too keen to make. It tends to trivialize what we do. And so the people I'm talking about are the, are the public, but the public are also the politicians. The politicians ultimately determine um, your salary. So it matters that we uh, uh, tell them what the reality of this thing is. So some fairly simple um, definitions which are good enough. Science is a demonstration of fundamentals. Technology is a scaled up science, but there's also a plural aspect of it here. Technology can be the combination of several sciences. Capability is installed technologies, so again uh, capabilities can incorporate several technologies and of course, of course product is delivered functionality and this is the general case. People don't buy what you're selling simply because it looks nice. They buy it because it's going to deliver something that they need. Cost-effective, functional, and quality. It's interesting to note that um, 
the, the technology just doesn't appear on that line. So I've got a diagram and it's uh, I'm still working on this diagram, I'm not really happy with it but at least it does capture what I'm trying to say. You've got a thought, you want a product. There is a whole bunch of capabilities that you need to make that happen. There is a process of work, it's a known process of work, it may take you years to get down that path but it's a known environment and that's where you want to be. Um, we know that a given capability can incorporate several technologies and there is actually a task of work involved in making that capability. It's not in the product development cycle, it's somewhere else, it's over here to the left. And we know that there is somewhere over here science and there is an unknown amount of work necessary to produce technologies. Could be very large, could be very small. But if you talk about, say, uh, carbon nanotubes, or if you talk about um, nuclear fusion for energy source, then clearly the science is known, the unknown part of it is how do you get it into technology? And it's getting that from a concept into something which is approaching usable. Actually, these, these sta this stage here can be huge. But nevertheless, this is the role of research. Essentially, it's acquire inquire, understand and establish because the objective is to establish capabilities that people can exploit. So it's only when people exploit it that the money flows back down the chain and supports you. The development activity is exploitation. It's using what you know how to do. Um, essentially, if you can know how to do everything then the risk associated with doing your product is low. It's an innovative product. People love terms like that. If you don't use um, well established then all that happens is you increase the risk. Disaster usually follows pretty quick because when people are desperate to keep their business afloat they will frequently clutch at some scientific straw and uh, they'll put it in place and they'll say right we've just got to make it work now and of course they never do. There's, there's always far too much unknown involved in that the product fails, they're able to blame the failure on the scientists who provided the raw technology, who didn't do their job properly, but nevertheless the business is gone. I pressed the button, something happened. Oh yes, technology readiness levels. You will come across this term if you haven't already. People are starting to use it more and more. Um, it again doesn't really quite tell the truth because capabilities when something has reached that stage in a business then you're betting your company on it. You're not going to bet your company on something which is at technology re level 4 and 5. It's really got to be pretty stable before you're going to bet the company on it. And so instead of going from 1 to 9 we actually go fairly rapidly to 9 and then these, these levels are all assuming that the, that the uh, the science is robust enough to be used in a product context where the business is dependent on it. I, put, I like to think of it in terms of mortgages. Business is about making money to allow people to have mortgages. Mortgage companies will only loan you money if they believe that you're going to be in work for 25 years. So it's, uh, it's all kind of in there. So, as I say, I'm not going to read this out. The capability model is an installed unit of technology. Um, They can be answers, they don't have to be actual technology, they can also be business related. Capabilities are the foundations for product development, that's the main thing. They're established by literally, by research, literally finding out. So it's of the known set and the unknown set and the next one, yep, we'll cover that. Research itself then is about finding out. Um, but it's not just about finding out the, si the sexy stuff which, is, which nobody knows the answer to. Frequently the stuff which is important to a business is how somebody else does it. So it's, um, if we wanted to go into the business of uh, photography for example, then research is finding out how Canon make f cameras. So it's not that there's a, a new, anything new involved in it, but at least we've got to start out with understanding where they are. Now of course it can go onto the uh, unknown set, but the thing that becomes an important part of this is this is longer term. So there's a short term research aspect and there's a longer term research aspect. The unknown set you're probably more familiar with, uh, targeted research, partnered research, so this is research in a specific area. Partnered research is co a collection of you coming together to address something which has a more systematic context. 
university and institute led research so this is from an, in, from a, an industrial point of view these are the, the sources of uh, this, this longer range research and then national support programs so in, es in essence there are a, a portfolio of research opportunities which are available to, uh, to industry and they include academia now the good news about that is academia is part of business now that's a, a break which has been uh, ignored for many years there is a great belief that, um, that academ academi academics are sitting in their ivory towers uh, smoking pot and you know and, and just dreaming dreams and not doing anything important that diagram that I put before links research into product development product development is where the money comes from the money is greatly interesting to governments because that's the economy and the economy is the money that they're able to spend to, to, to make themselves seem important and they, if they don't have that then they're not going to tell they're not going to be making any statements about how important technology is to uh, the nation as a whole and they're not going to be making the right decisions about uh, which, um, which sciences and so on are trained in schools and what the priorities are in universities so it matters this is why that's very specific it frequently is internal it's frequently secret we're not going to tell you what processes we're working on that's a, that's an important detail it stays inside the company but there are a lot of other research things fundamental issues which need to be addressed which are not just important to us, arm, but important to other people as well. So what are we going to do below about 8 nanometer? We really don't know. Uh, the transistors are getting down, down to atomic dimensions, the variability is huge, the reliability is appalling, the sensitivity to high energy particles is going up all the time. We're going to have to have a different uh, model we can't rely on the uh, uh, on the one-to-one um, -one ratio between uh, a, a model, the Boolean model, and the physical implementation anymore. Or maybe we can. The thing about it is, it's an unknown area, and it's going to affect a lot of us. And if we don't have any answers in there, we probably can't go to eight nanometers. And that's a big problem because that means that the next opportunity in the process, we're not going to be able to exploit. Guided by roadmaps. Now the roadmaps are related to business objectives but only in the broadest sense, they're not, they're not product related. Developers on the other hand, they're all about delivering a technical product. It could be a tangible product or it could be an intangible product and we'll come back to that later as well. Um, nevertheless, uh, some of the products that, you, that a company might ship you can pick up you can deliver it in a, in a truck or a lorry. Other products that a company might ship are entirely knowledge based or a file on a computer. It doesn't stop any of them being products, they're all genuine. The definition really of a product is whether somebody is prepared to pay you for it because uh, it has value or it may not always be obvious what it is. But the engineer's role is very definitely delivery oriented. Design is a creative role within development and we have to, we have to uh, remember that, that development is the, the product focus on this thing. It's not just good enough to get the chip design right, it has to work. We have to satisfy the end product because that's when the money flows back down the chain. That's when your contribution gets valued, even if it doesn't get recognised. Engineers still have plenty of opportunity to be innovative though because the capabilities that they've got still have lots of room in them how you put the capabilities together. Let's look at the, uh, the, the solutions that people came up to to that computing problem in the past. They were limited by the technologies that were available. You're still limited by the technologies and the capabilities that are available. You can do lots within it however. You can make a bad product or you can make a good product and you've got the same set of technologies available to you. So it's exciting. But innovation is and will remain a fundamental of engineering. The nature of engineer is to look at the spectrum of, of opportunities which are available to you and to put together something which is going to be really great while somebody else can look at that same spectrum and produce something which is rubbish. <coughs> and this of course, because it's now delivering a product, is di directed by specific product plans. 
So you have a marketing department now, they're telling me, we want this thing, it's got, to do, it's got to do that, it's got to be available by the week after next, and there's a great big pile of money here to make it happen. And that's, what, that's where the money comes in. <clears throat> now, the product, however, is a fairly easy thing to define, but, you know, here's, here's a screwdriver. You know, different idea, here's a customer, here's a supplier, or maybe the other way around, different ideas. It's very important to get that common understanding right. I want a screwdriver, please. You, know, you get the wrong thing delivered. Um, matching, customers and uh, matching customers' expectations is, is kind of tricky. Um, the only thing you know is your product must exceed your customers' needs, but you don't want to do it by too much. And if it's less, it's no good. Uh, functionality is assumed. You don't buy a screwdriver and then try and undo a screw with it and then the end comes off. You know, it's, um, it's functionality is assumed. You don't get paid extra for delivering something that works. And customers are not always the best source of new product ideas. Um, you know, whether, whether a customer would have specified a screwdriver for opening a can, doubt it. Uh, the text messaging system uh, on smartphones was never, never prescribed by any customer. In fact, most of the customers of it weren't even born when GSM phones were first created. The end product is very special, and I've got to emphasise this particular point, because it's the, I'll keep on about this, it's the end product which actually links money back into the chain, and it's the money which funds the entire value chain, and the end customer is you. So we're, we're, we're um, bending back on ourselves at this stage, because we all go home at night, and we forget the difficulties of creating technology and we go and buy something from PC World because it's exciting. Um, so we are very two-faced about this and we don't buy it because of the technology, we buy it because it delivers what we want. Research outcomes can be products um, even though they are never going to be an end product. <coughs> and the business model, like it or not, and the whole business of associating yourself with money actually seems kind of tacky, seems dirty, but actually it's very real. If you're going to have a, a product which has got any kind of existence, then you need a business model to make, it, to make the company viable, to make it work. Um, so businesses sell things that customers want to buy. This is a, an interesting point. They focus more and more these days on their core competencies. So once upon a time, probably about 30 years ago, businesses were single entities, a big factory, one roof, one smoking chimney. Thousands of people come in and they go out every day. Um, and all of the things that that business needed to do were inside that building. So if you had a planning department, a design department, a manufacturing, everything was still inside that building. To a certain extent, this is still the model of um, economic production that the government call manufacturing. So they still believe in this single, single entity manufacturing thing. And so you'll notice that an awful lot of the incentives uh, are towards manufacturing. And the manufacturing that they understand, even though they deny it and say it's much broader than that, the manufacturing is about putting physical things together. So virtual things tend not to count. So I'm telling you this. You understand that's the way their, their minds work, you can help to change it. Now, uh, businesses, uh, governments like commoditization. Businesses hate it. Businesses, uh, government wants us to, to uh, get into a situation of commoditization because that way all of the prices will be minimized. Competition is good. Businesses avoid uh, commoditization like the plague. They all want to be different. What does this word mean? Commoditization. Um, well, if it's something which is a commodity, then um, uh, then it's being bought essentially for for its functionality. So, petrol is a commodity. Um, a uh, chopping board is a commodity. These are things, or a loaf of bread. These are things which really don't differ. Whoever makes them, they're still the same thing. They're sold in large quantities. Commoditization is losing individuality. So. Um, uh, a, 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 a microbrewery will produce a, a different beer, which is not a commoditized beer because it has some additional features. So we avoid commoditization in industry by trying to not make the same product as our competitors. And we differentiate, so the products may only be subtly different, but they're different enough that the people who buy it 
want to buy it on the basis of that, that difference. So, ARM's a CPU. There's nothing that clever about a CPU, but the package of which it's sold, which enables people to incorporate it into an integrated circuit into a system, is unique, it's different. And that differentiation is the thing which gives it value. So, um, cost and quality by improving processes, commoditization, improving business model, which takes the money, is commoditization. But new and improved technology does give you the offer of benefit. So that's why people tend to be interested in technology, but not every technology. Because it may be expensive and risky as well to use it. So the penalty for incorporating some new technology may be an improvement, a differentiation, but it may be just the thing that needs to bring you to the edge or push you over it. So product development because of this is a risk and it's a risk to be minimized. And this is bad news because generally speaking it means you're always going to have budgets which are smaller than you want them to be. You'll always have teams which are smaller than they need to be. And you're always going to be working on timescales which are shorter than they need to be. But these are, you know, the, the reality of the situations. These are exciting technology but they just enable options. So graphene is no use to me in our business model in ARM for example. Uh, it might be useful to somebody else but it's not useful to me. Um, it can, new technology may cost more than it delivers in product value and that's a decision that's, that is an uncomfortable one to make. Um, you know it makes sense to move to 10 nanometers. Well actually it's going to cost us a lot and the reliability issues may greatly exceed the benefit that we get out of uh, having a slightly smaller chip. Over design costs money, it takes effort and it doesn't deliver anything. People don't buy anything that, doesn't, that goes beyond what they need. And reuse saves, and reuse is boring, right? It's much more exciting to start with a clean sheet of paper. It's never like that. Nowadays, a clean sheet of paper just doesn't happen. And the slightly worrying factor on this is it's the successful products that determine the technology of all of the other products that follow below. So it doesn't matter necessarily what the, um, the, the, the legitimacy of the product is. So it might be a computer game, it might be a, um, uh, something lowly anyway, a, a remote controller. But if that sells in sufficient volumes, then the technologies which are used in it become the technologies which are used in other domains as well. They become, they dominate all other activities. So it's like the, the computer, as I said earlier. Now we, I'll look at what I mean by that in a little bit more detail here. If you go back to around the 1970s, pretty well the only computers that existed were mainframe computers. Now, today we tend to think of mainframe computers as mostly gone away, but if you look at the numbers, they're probably bigger than they ever were. Uh, they're certainly a significant number and they're still out there and there are businesses, people and uh, operations who are, who are making mainframe computers. On the mainframe we've got minis, personal, desktop. Let's stop here for a moment. The numbers of course are so much bigger that the technologies justify the, the, the quantity in the market justifies the investment in the technology. This technology ripples down. So we're able to use the smallest geometry uh, CMOS processes in the mainframe computers. We still get that benefit, it's a good one. Mobile internet is your, is your laptops and then of course we're heading towards and unfortunately the line doesn't show up too well, Internet of Things. Well what does Internet of Things basically means from a marketing point is it's another order of magnitude bigger market. It's a new market. New markets, bigger markets mean more commercial opportunity. That's what it is, it doesn't really matter what the name means. The thing about it is though the other disconcerting things along this accent, ax, axis, the bottom end was professional, the top end is now consumer. And so the, the thing that was leading the development down here was professional. And the thing that's leading it now is consumer, who know, who know or care nothing about the technology which is in it. So I'm going to deviate a little bit, uh, I've got to watch my time, I'm getting a bit slow. Um, ARM enabling innovation across the industry, this of course is uh, it's a bit of a statement about where we are but it also says that you know, all the way from lots of trivia through to bigger machines these days it's very difficult to avoid the presence of ARM and the reason it's difficult to avoid the presence is that we're enabling people to develop these big and complex systems 
So we're, we're delivering something that they need. They can't deliver them any other practical way. They could replicate the ARM <coughs> um, component, but it would actually cost them engineering time and effort, and they haven't got it. They just they need to get on. They've got a product to produce, and getting on and delivering it is the, is the principal objective. Now, back in 1991, that was the ARM computer. It was pretty simple, actually. The concept of making it available as an electronic component in a Lego brick-like model was a fairly simple thing to say and the first chip that we produced and we did it down here at Plessy in, uh, in Robra looked like that. That was that core and the rest of the chip looking at it. A single core. Today um, we have a, a very much different situation thanks to Moore's Law but Moore's Law, Gordon Moore, 1965 he was talking about designing ICs with 50 transistors in and his law at the time and his law is still good after 50 years and it's given us billions of transistors now now I use this, this uh, graph a couple of times and you'll come back to it but it's actually a 1999 vintage graph and it shows where ARM was at about that time around a million transistors were available to an integrated circuit when ARM was founded um, to put it into a today axis to this, we're not so very far beyond this graph um, and actually still pretty well right, so I'm not going to dwell too much on that. The main thing about it is, back in uh, 2010, you could buy 20 billion transistors for 5 euros, around 3 pounds. Um, compare that to the 1 million transistors when ARM was founded, and you suddenly see why that chip that I showed you earlier looked so very simple. Today's integrated circuits are 20,000 times more complex logically and 10 times the speed that's 200,000 times the design challenge even on a linear basis that's not assuming that it's a square law um, and there is a lot of uh, grounds for believing that uh, the complexity is actually a square law relationship not a linear relationship but even 200,000 times in 25 years that's an awful lot of capacity that good old uh, Gordon Moore's law has given us it means that today um, ARM's CPUs don't look like that simple model. This is the top end one, which is actually a quad core. Um, this is a, a top end Mali DSP processor, which is also a, something like an eight core equivalent of. And yet we still have that simple, tra that simple CPU, which is the, um, the M series, M0 here, which is about 50,000 transistors, which is actually smaller than the original implementation. But a scale of transistors from 50,000 to 50 million for an individual implementations. And we've still got billions of transistors on, a, on a, a, an integrated circuit. It's not just a case of making the integrated circuit, it's a case of making it work. So they're in families, 24 processors, 6 families. You've got the systems of how you connect them together. So each one of those is a quad core. So here's a system which allows you to get connect together four quad co core systems and the DSPs which can be clustered as well and connecting it to the rest of the system and attaching the extra special um, source that you want to put in to make it into the successful product that you have in mind and all of this environment we didn't think about this when we started it was a simple CPU core but you have to have the software the drivers, the ports, the utilities you have to have a partnership world which will enable you to uh, integrate into the rest of this community and <coughs> to, today that gives us around a, th a thousand partners who are helping with this, uh, this dream and the dream gives us uh, some solutions in areas where we previously couldn't have achieved them and I'm going to come back to this as reuse because the other line that I didn't show you on here, here was the transistor line, this one here was the productivity line uh, so that's gates per person month or whatever the thing about it was that back in the days when ARM was founded it was around a hundred person years of effort to create an integrated circuit today we're talking about thousands of person years to, integrate in, uh, to make an integrated circuit from ground up on top of that the verification gap also came in we're seriously talking if we were designing integrated circuits from the ground up every stage we would be spending tens to hundreds of thousands of man years to design each one of them we can't do it so we have to do reuse and it turned out 
that that's what ARM was actually delivering, was reuse. Because back here, an integrated circuit was the result of a single designer. It moved into the small team domain when ARM was, uh, was in its foundation fall. Local teams, you know, it wasn't a small team anymore, but you could at least put it in one office. These days it's global teams. We're all designing components. So, an inter so our CPU that we're designing today isn't designed in one office. It's designed in four or five offices in our all cold ARM all around the world. The corollary to that means that you could afford a clean sheet back there, but you can't now. We're talking about expertise reuse. So people are now contributing to their product development, to the product development by including incredibly specialist knowledge that they've spent their entire team, their entire life focusing and improving on, and they deliver it as a business. So it's not just even inside the same uh, enterprise anymore. And without more than 90% reuse, and the actual number today is probably 99%, but it's an uncomfortable number. Uh, it would just be impossible to make the complex systems that we're selling today and shipping. It's not just in the hardware, it's in the software and it's in the other chips which go into a system. So designer productivity has become the methodology driver. Um, the product possibilities offered by using billions of transistors, of course, are very exciting. Um, but it, you've got to deliver it. There's no point in having the billions of transistors there if you can't actually use them because the systems have become too complex to implement. <clears throat> so, ARM technology in a product like this, and this is a, a, a graphic which is aimed at uh, the city as much as anything else, but I think it does illustrate it quite nice. ARM doesn't make these, and it doesn't make those in there either. Um, even the one that's got an arm on it isn't made by arm. You know, arm, arm, you delve inside that, you find that there's the CPU part of it, and that's, that's delivered by arm. We also do the cell libraries and a few other bits and pieces. But essentially, we're operating right down inside there. But we're operating in all of those chips. Almost all of the chips which you find inside your smartphone have actually got arm technology in them as well. That range of uh, major product types and the software tools to make it happen and the methodologies that we talked about before. It means that last year we shipped 10 billion ARM CPUs. That's 10,000 million ARM CPUs. That's more than one for every person on the planet. And we've shipped 50 billion so far. Interestingly, 2008, we had only shipped 10 billion ever. So we've shipped 40 billion between 2008 and today. And this number is, that number is going up by 25% per annum. This is a huge number. Of course, we don't make any of the chips, any of them. So it's all by our partner, through our partnerships. It's a strange model of behavior, but it's a legitimate business model. But also, some people will tell you that it only takes a year, two years to get a product to market. This tells you it takes six years to get a product to market. There's two years when you're working on it. It's entirely at your own cost. There's, sorry, two to three years. There's two to three years where having demonstrated the concept, your partner is thinking, hey, that's neat, I'll put that into my next generation of product, and he's going to be working on that for two to three years. Your smartphone doesn't happen overnight, despite what people tell you. And it's, some of these products, incidentally, are still good from our point of view 20 years later, so we're still selling the early designs that we were making 20 years ago. Again, they haven't gone away, they're just being incorporated into new products. Now these this six year here is a particularly important one because for the first three of it you've got no revenue as a company. The second three of it you start to get revenue coming in as they start to start to be more successful. But you don't really get a peak revenue out of that design activity for nearly six years after you started work on that. That tends to be, people say, oh we have a new product coming out every year. What they've got is a pipeline. They've got six products being developed and they start each one of them a year later than the other. And each one of them is going to be the most complex product in the world that has ever been, because that's what happens. <clears throat> I talked about the public misunderstanding of R&D, and it's what I call the monotask. Uh, people believe that there is this process called R&D, which is where it comes from, and there's a, co process called prod there's a thing called product, which is what they buy. 
Uh, if they're talking about RD and I, where the innovation word comes in, an in innovative product is differentiated from an ordinary product because it costs less. That's the, uh, that's the real public definition of innovation. Um, but it matters that we help to disillusion people about this because if they understand it, then they will recognize us more. And if they recognize us more, then uh, you know, not only do we get more money, but we get more support for the things that we want to do as well. Getting the technology into an icon, we all know the amount of things that go into these products, um, but generally speaking, the industry doesn't say very much about it. Apple, back in 2011, identified 159 tier one suppliers into their products. In that list, Apple, uh, ARM isn't even mentioned. ARM is in the tier two supplier group, which is 10 times bigger by all people's estimation. And there are lots and lots of other people, of course, in that. These are products which are not the product of a single company. They're products of millions of engineers, tens of thousands of companies operating all around the world. So conclusions. These are the most complex machines ever, and they're driven by the high volume commercial opportunities, uh, generally by customers who uh, don't recognize the technology value in this. Customers buy the satisfaction of a niche. Uh, capabilities. I talked about these. Remember that they're the bridge between research outcomes and products. It's very important that that bridge is established because if research is to have meaning, then it has to have uh, a link to the money gaining exercise. And Moore's Law has provided us with a huge technology opportunity for 50 years. The question is, how many more? We really don't know. And we do know that it's facing some serious challenges, but there's nothing. Um, Nothing guaranteed in this area. We do, th do know that it's an exponential, and exponentials never go on forever. So there's a lot of change in your, uh, in your futures, and I hope you enjoy it. Um, just to remember that the commercial imperative can never wait for the right solution. That machine which is, cr which is making product, which is selling and uh, making money to keep itself alive, has to find a solution, not the best solution. And it's, a, uh, it's a, a thing to bear in mind for academics in particular because the pursuit of the correct answer, the right answer, is, is never going to be a commercial opportunity. Arms vision and the end. So thank you very much for listening.